Hi, I want to welcome our guest for today, John Thomas, who is Vice President and Distinguished Engineer at IBM Expert Labs, and Ashley Castlevan, who's Executive Director of the Responsible AI Institute. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Well, tell us a little bit about what you guys do and what, uh, what uh, organization, what, what, a little bit about your organizations as well. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I work in a part of IBM called Expert Labs, and this is an organization that works with clients in implementing technology solutions using IBM software. Perfect. Uh, I'm Ashley, the executive director of the Responsible AI Institute. We're a nonprofit organization that's to get it dedicated to ensuring that AI is built in a responsible, equitable, safe manner. So everybody's really into AI these days. <laughs> Companies are investing in it, a lot of people are interested in it, but there's an equal focus on responsible AI. Can you tell me what is driving all this interest? You know, Deborah, there are a few different forces that are coming together to drive this, this demand. Uh, one of them is brand reputation. You know, companies use AI for decision making, especially decision making around um, health, wealth, uh, related to humans. There is a concern around the reputation of the brand getting affected if you use AI in an incorrect fashion. So there is that force. And then there is an equally important force coming from the regulatory side, which is saying, um, you know, what are the guardrails around the use of AI that we should put in place and that companies need to uh, adhere to? So these two forces are coming together. And then there is just the notion of doing the right thing, you know, doing the right thing when you use AI for decision making augmenting humans. These forces, what do you think? Ashley? Yeah, I think I would just add to that. So there's a lot of public surveys that have been done that are really um, trying to understand the public sentiment related to the use, increased use of AI systems. And sometimes it's really obvious when we're using AI, uh, like we have a Siri or Alexa that's giving us orders and telling us where to go and then it's helping us kind of guide our lives. Uh, other times it's not so obvious. You don't always know that on the other side of a service chat bot, it's a person or it's not. Uh, and those are kind of customer facing examples, but more and more AI is being integrated into everything that we do and all of the services that are being delivered. And so with that, there's a inherent lack of trust. And as John said, if it's impacting our livelihoods, our health, our wealth, we're really concerned uh, and as we should be in terms of just not knowing what these systems are doing and so as a result of that um, and this this lack of trust there's been a lot of effort for people to understand what are the actual um, intended or unintended consequences that can come from these systems and they could impact people's lives uh, access to care uh, access to uh, um, money that helps them grow their lives uh, when we're thinking about things like automated decision making systems and so for that reason uh, there's been a lot of efforts to just understand not how to stop innovation, but how do you make it uh, be developed in a way that is equitable to uh, all people, all groups of people uh, as much as possible. That's a very notable goal. <laughs> uh, but what challenges need to be addressed here? See, this, this notion of trustworthiness or um, having responsible use of AI, there are a set of um, what the industry is agreeing to as common uh, aspects that we need to address. One of them, which you probably have heard a lot about, Deborah, is fairness in how AI is being used for decision making. So we want to make sure that uh, when a decision is being made, whether it is, as Ashley was saying, around healthcare or credit um, decisions, it is not biased. And this notion of bias, it's, it's, uh, it depends on what the use case is and what sensitive aspects you're looking at. It could be age, it could be gender. Are men and women being treated in different ways? And, well, is it within the guidelines of what a policy would it take? You're not saying that everybody should have always the same answer. Right? That's not what you're saying. But is the system consistently putting one group at an advantage or, or a disadvantage compared to the other group? Right? So fairness is one aspect. Explainability is another aspect. When there is some decision being made, Ashley and I both apply for credit. I get credit, she doesn't, or the other way around. And I can ask, why was I denied and why was she granted? So what is the explanation behind why a decision was made by the AI or machine learning system? Then uh, robustness, you know, is it is it able to behave? Is the, is the AI able to behave in a con 
consistent fashion under adverse situations. For example, um, you know, it may not be attacks against the system. It might just be uh, changing or drifting data patterns. We all know with the pandemic, data patterns have changed. Customer touch points mm -hmm. have changed. And is the, is the machine learning model behaving very different from when it was built or trained using pre-pandemic data? So how do you put guardrails around that robustness, right? Then there is this idea of uh, transparency, which is, you know, I use the example, if I buy something from a grocery store, I look at what it is and it says, where was it made? What is in it? What is the calorie count? Although I don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when does it expire? What is in it, right? So just like that, um, for AI, you need to have all the facts around AI at your fingertips without it being a huge labor-intensive task uh, of collecting them. And then privacy, right? So as you deal with data that is used to train and build these models and then you have a feedback ground truth data coming in, can you preserve the integrity of the data? If your rules and policies in place, how do you make sure those are kept through the lifetime of the, of the, of the AI? So all of these are challenges that need to be addressed. We think of these as uh, pillars, or uh, pillars is a good way of, of, of saying, you know, these are pillars that make up responsible AI constructs. What do you want? No. Yeah, I would just uh, add to that. I think these are great examples and a really good, uh, we're what the work that we're trying to do within the Responsible AI Institute is um, develop a certification mark. So the work that uh, John's talking about, or some of the challenges John's talking about, we're trying to address by putting appropriate guardrails or governance around uh, those efforts. Um, earlier he mentioned that there are some efforts related to regulators thinking about what these implications are and how to react to that. Um, here in the UK, um, the, uh, the government of the UK is looking at AI assurance programs. Uh, and so within that context, uh, we're really trying to think about what are those labels or what are the kite marks that you put um, onto this so that there is that comfort from the public. One of the key things though, even related to bias that I would just add to the, the definition um, that John's put together in terms of what some of those issues are, um, is accountability. And um, a big piece of how these um, systems are developed, as John was mentioning, there's this this desire for explainability. These systems are usually a black box that leads to a lack of trust. We don't know what's inside of it, how it was made, how it was configured. But um, when you know that there was a review board or a body that actually looked at that information, um, that body was representative of the people that are the target use of that system, that's um, providing a lot more assurance and comfort um, to know that there can be trust in the use of that uh, in that tool. Just to follow up on that uh, answer, Ashley, um, so how, uh, how important is, is it to have an independent certification of responsible AI, and how far along are we in that regard? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think it's of the utmost importance. Um, one of the things, even from some of the examples that we're providing, you can see that AI is not one monolithic thing. Uh, AI is a ton of things and can impact, uh, it can have different types of risk that are carried with it. Um, sometimes high risk, sometimes low risk, uh, but we don't always know. And so um, by applying something like a certification mark, uh, similar, I like the analogy of uh, LEED, which is the certification for how buildings are designed and uh, maintained to be done in an environmental and energy efficient way. With those similar types of goals in mind, uh, we've taken the definition that uh, John's talking about and most of the community talks about in terms of what is responsible AI uh, and developed an evaluation for that. Uh, and we're now uh, proud to announce that we're actually under formal review for that certification. It's been in development for the past uh, two and a half years uh, with members like IBM uh, and our other uh, members within the community, including subject matter experts from academia, civil society, and other governments. And so with that, we think we have a fairly uh, robust robust and comprehensive uh, evaluation that can try and mitigate some of the, the harms or challenges that we talked about uh, today. So we're under review right now officially. Uh, we're testing that out in a pilot uh, with, uh, as I said, Standards Council of Canada. There's a harmonized review uh, with UCAS uh, here in the UK. And so we recognize that um, AI systems don't, like other technologies, don't have physical boundaries like we do in how our current governance is set up. Uh, so it's 
important that uh, countries review these, uh, uh, these activities together to try and protect the public as much as possible. Well, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, John, I just want to ask you computationally, how do you ensure trustworthiness in AI? So how can you do this? Yeah, interesting question there, Rob. So, you know, we talked about the different pillars of trustworthiness, right? fairness, explainability, etc. So one of the fundamental principles we are adopting in IBM is this, when we put guardrails around this, it has to be as non-intrusive as possible and as open as possible. So with that in mind, um, uh, so IBM Research actually came out with a set of frameworks for each of these pillars which we open source, actually. So if you look at um, things like the AIF 360 framework or the AI Explainability 360 framework, these are open source frameworks which you can apply against AI and ML built using any technology, including non-IBM technology, right? So you might be using just open source, you might be using some of our competitions tools to build models, that's okay. We are providing um, frameworks which can monitor, which can report, and which can help with mitigation uh, as you work with these models. So what we have then done is we have taken those concepts that, that we have open source and then sort of hardened it into a product set. So IBM Cloud Pack for Data is an actual product set that brings these at an enterprise scale to, the, to businesses. And it is the same mindset. It is open. It is heterogeneous. It fits into existing environments where, let's say, um, the business has built out or is building out AI machine learning models using technologies that are not even IBM. So what we do is we can sit in there. We can, uh, we can monitor those models through different stages of, it, of the life cycle of AI, uh, collect facts about models during the model build, model test, model validation, model deployment, model uh, decommissioning stages, collect those facts, map them against the um, the, suggest the suggestions from, for example, Responsible AI's framework, and give a view of how these models are behaving against the controls that a schema that a scheme owner is providing. So as non-intrusive as possible, but but also supporting um, a wide variety of tools for basically uh, fact collection, um, monitoring reporting and mitigation steps. Yeah. And maybe just to add to that really quickly, one of the things that uh, we see, and John's talking about the use of open source tools for AI development is very common. And part of the challenge with that is that you can build an AI system in a matter of months, a matter of weeks. And so one of the things that we want to do is make sure that the oversight of that uh, is is relational to the amount of time it takes to develop. So you don't want a system that's being built in 12 weeks and it takes 12 months to have an independent audit um, to get that certification. So with that, um, doing this programmatically is quite important um, because it can also be there uh, understanding the ongoing monitoring of the system while in an AI sense, uh, it could potentially change. And so when John's yeah. talking about data and model drift, these are things that uh, we want to make sure that the system's continuing to operate in the way that it's expected to. So Deborah, the way to think of this is there is, um, for example, if um, as Ray brings the frameworks and controls for aspects like fairness, um, drift, quality, et cetera, to, and they publish that in the context of a given domain. So maybe it is a domain of uh, procurement or domain of loan decisioning in the financial sector, right? There is a set of uh, controls, a set of um, um, schema uh, that has been defined. And what the tooling is doing is, uh, where we, this is, by the way, um, a collaborative effort that we are just uh, you know, starting to mm -hmm. work together on. Um, the, in an ideal situation, what happens is we should be able to make API calls into these frameworks, understand what the uh, parameters and uh, uh, guardrails are for the given use case in that given industry sector. You know, what is an acceptable threshold for fairness or what are uh, ranges that are acceptable for drift? You have that and you also have the qualitative questions that are coming in from the Ray framework which says, what actions did you take with your data to ensure there was, uh, you know, that you took uh, some steps to address bias that exists in historical data. So there are qualitative and quantitative things coming in from the Ray framework, and then the IBM tooling, Cloud Pack for Data, 
it looks at how the models are actually behaving and then you, you bring the two together into a view which says, well, are you, how close are you to being compliant? How close are you to meeting the requirements from a standards or a regulatory perspective, right? So bringing these two pieces together. So what recommendations would you give to organizations just starting out on this journey towards responsible AI? Well, uh, <laughs> learn about this space. It is super important. Um, not just because um, there are regulations around the space, but it's also the right thing to do, uh, number one. Number two, I would say this is very much a cross-functional mm -hmm. thing. It is not just a technology thing. It is not just a, an organizational thing. Different personas in, an in, a, in a company have different roles to play. You know, the, the chief executive, uh, the chief data officer, um, the chief risk officer, the data science team, the operations team, the policy makers, ha all have different but equally important roles to play in the context of ensuring AI is trustworthy. So look at it from a cross-functional, uh, across the company perspective. Then really look at what um, um, nonprofits like uh, Ray are doing. Um, I would say what Ray is doing. <laughs> I don't even say like, uh, because I think uh, truly they are blazing a path here. Um, in terms of what is happening in terms of the, uh, the standards bodies, in terms of the, um, the uh, regulatory bodies, and how um, Ray is providing this bridge between implementation and, and standards, being the, uh, the scheme owner. And then, of course, look at the technology. I mean, IBM is here to help. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we can work with, um, with models built using non-IBM technology, but our goal is to make sure that as the adoption of AI scales, we have the right pieces in place to make sure it is used in a trustworthy, responsible manner. Yeah, I would just build from that and share that I think first and foremost, it's important to identify what the challenge is with your systems. So it's one thing to be innovative. We all, as I said earlier, um, believe that AI is the future. We believe that AI is going to help us to solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Um, if it is built in a way that is protecting <laughs> the people, the public, the planet. Um, and so these are things that just understanding what potential um, issues could arise from deploying AI in your system first and foremost. And then as John said, working with organizations like ours, um, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of deep thinking on this. Um, well, I appreciate that I think that we put a pretty good framework together to kind of consolidate all of that. Um, our mission is to to create awareness that these issues are occurring and that um, there's something that you can do about it. It's not just a unintended, or it's not just a consequence of deploying it. Um, there's mitigation measures that can be taken and should be taken. And uh, what we're seeing too is that um, if you're you're not doing that and there is greater awareness that uh, there can be efforts, um, you're opening yourself up to additional risks, whether that be um, consumers are just not interested in consuming your product anymore, um, or that we're seeing a lot more uh, tort cases related to um, human rights infringements um, to these systems, especially because now there's no in. This is a, a, a more common conversation within the AI community. Yep. Wonderful. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Deborah, Thanks thank you for having, having us. us.